my name's Pam Minkley. I'm a clinical educator for Philips Respironics in the U.S. I've been invited here to Philips Pakistan to help provide a sleep school for Dow University. We've done a sleep school this past week and we've been there about five days. The, the actual purpose of the sleep school was to provide education for primary care practitioners so that they can recognize sleep disorders and also training for people who will be working with Dow University in a sleep center. They've asked me while I was here to provide an in-service for the general practitioner and physicians on obstructive sleep apnea. We'll look at why they would diagnose this, why it's important, and some of the things they'd look for so that they can recognize people with the sleep apnea. And when recognized, to see what we would do to treat it and where they need to send them. When we finish this presentation, you should be able to describe obstructive sleep apnea. You should be able to then discuss the consequences if left untreated. And additionally, outline some of the treatment options. Describe the physiology for CPAP therapy and discuss the components of the CPAP unit so that you understand what that type of therapy is about. As you probably know, there are lots of people with undiagnosed sleep apnea. There are about 20 million in the United States and worldwide the incident runs about the same. It runs about one in four people have some sort of sleep disordered breathing that is undiagnosed and untreated. It impacts all genders, all ages, and all walks of life. There are some groups that are slightly more prone to have sleep apnea. For instance, uh, truckers oftentimes, and sometimes the people who are obese have a BMI a little greater than 25. So there are subgroups, but overall we're looking at about one in four adults will have some form of untreated sleep disordered breathing. So if it is left untreated, what are the consequences? In the short term, Term, one of the primary things we see is industrial and automotive accidents. Excessive sleepiness is common, however, most of the time the patients don't recognize the extra sleepiness because it's come on slowly, it's been an insidious increase, and they really will usually deny it and actually not recognize it. So that's not likely to be a symptom they'll come to you with. But the decreased quality of life slowly fades and not recognized by the patient, but there. And there are neurocognitive and performance deficits mostly because of the sleep deprivation. Interestingly, the patients often come with saying that they're good sleepers because they can fall asleep anywhere, any place, but that's not a good sleeper. A good sleeper should take 20 minutes or so to fall asleep. So they don't recognize the fact that they are actually sleep disabled, we might say. In the long term, if left untreated, additionally, patients will tend to develop hypertension, heart disease, heart attack, arrhythmias, stroke, and also impaired glucose tolerance, which means then that the patients you have currently with arrhythmias, particularly with arrhythmia uh, atrial fibrillation and diabetes the, and hypertension are folks in a population that really should be scanned. This is a, a, a very complex slide, um, but it looks at what happens when obstructive apnea is left untreated. When, if you look up at the top left where it says wakefulness there, it, the airway is open and awake and supported. So air flows 
in and out easily. The second we fall asleep, there's a little bit of airway compromise. The airway becomes unstable and the airflow is compromised slightly. For those who are at risk with increased upper airway resistance, uh, for instance, nasal rhinitis or big tonsils, uh, small anatomical throat area, those folks will oftentimes be at risk that when they're lying down, the negative pressure from the diaphragm going down to suck air in will actually suck the air co airway closed. Once the airway collapses, if you look down at the bottom part of the tracing there, the oxygen drops, carbon dioxide increases, and they increase their efforts to breathe, which causes more negative pressure within the chest and often can affect the venous return to the heart. Once those issues have started to occur, particularly the increased carbon dioxide and decreased oxygen, the body goes into a fight or flight response. It's no, it sees that as air not coming in, a vital and critical problem for the body. So it responds no different than it would if someone came in while you were sleeping and put a pillow over your head and stopped you from breathing. There's a stress response. People fight to breathe by trying harder and harder. They eventually arouse from sleep, take a deep breath in, hyperventilate, blow off carbon dioxide and oxygen, and then eventually wake up and breathe again. During this whole process, there is a huge, huge increase in sympathetic activity. It's not uncommon that folks who have obstructive sleep apnea will go through this process 20, 30, 40, 50, even 100 times an hour. So the sympathetic activity is elevated for a very long time. This results frequently in insulin resistance and with insulin resistance we end up with a secondary problem of obesity and diabetes and then with the obesity and diabetes, we then have a higher risk for cardiovascular disease. So this is, tends to be the cycle of untreated sleep apnea and how it can end up then with all of these cardiovascular consequences. If untreated OSA is responsible for many industrial and uh, motor vehicle crashes, there in the U.S. there's about 40,000 deaths a year and six million industries or million injuries uh, related to online accidents in other countries, depending on the um, concentration of the trucking industry. It's more. We see it in the train in planes, everywhere in industry. Additionally, when we look at the key signs, other industries fail as well. The excessive daytime sleepiness are one of the symptoms that patients may come with, but as I mentioned earlier, they frequently don't admit to that. They don't realize it. The biggest symptom that we'll see is snoring. Snoring is a common symptom to a lot of people, but when you think about it, snoring is a reduction in the size of the airway. So so already a patient is in trouble, but it is so common that we don't think of it as a problem. But it is a symptom. Snoring should always be taken seriously, and if there are any pauses in breathing in association with the snoring too, then that is a, those are serious symptoms that any physician should consider referring a patient for further evaluation for possible obstructive sleep apnea. If they admit to waking up choking in the night, uh, these are key symptoms and clearly have a high probability of having obstructive sleep apnea. Additional signs and symptoms are often morning headaches, irritability, depression, memory loss, 
lack of concentration, frequent nighttime urination. Um, any of these in combination with the snoring and a patient clearly should be referred for evaluation of treat and treatment of sleep apnea. So what are the risk and comorbidities that we discuss? Hypertension. In 30 to 50 percent of the patients with OSA, they'll have hypertension and with treatment they sometimes can lower or eliminate their medications. Heart failure is also common among the obstructive apnea people and as I mentioned earlier atrial fibrillation particularly those patients who once they do cardiovert don't remain converted and in a normal sinus rhythm. Almost always that are those folks will be positive for obstructive sleep apnea and when treated they will remain cardioverted.